Hi everyone, and a warm welcome to this week's episode of Low Season Traveller Insider Guides. I'm Jed Brown, your host for this week's episode, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Chum Pham, who's the Sales and Partnerships Manager for ITS Vietnam, the leading travel service provider specializing in inbound tourism throughout Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. As a distinguished and enduring Vietnamese destination management company, ITS take great pride in their consistent delivery of exceptional customer service, and I can testify that they know Vietnam like no one else. Enjoy. So, Chum, you are most welcome to the Low Season Traveller Insider Guides podcast. Great to finally get you on the show. Thank you, Jed. Thanks for uh, trusting me and my insights and for having me here today. Hopefully, I will be able to provide some useful insights and information about Vietnam. With, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and for our listeners out there, myself and Chum got to know each other, gosh, during the dark days of COVID, Chum, wasn't <laughs> it really? Um, during those, gosh, I try not to think about those days anymore. Um, but you've been a great friend and advocate of low season traveler since we since we started back in you know 2020 really and want to thank you for that and i've wanted to get you on the show we've met up a few times in at different travel shows as well and we've kept in contact the whole time and it's a relationship which is really important to us but i've wanted to get you on the podcast for quite some time because we haven't got done a podcast on vietnam yet and without a shadow of a doubt you're the best person to speak to so I suppose, first of all, for our listeners, give us a little bit of a background to yourself and ITS and, you know, what, what you guys do. Yeah. Firstly, thank you for, obviously, of the very, very close relationships that we have been able to build over the year. Yeah. Don't know how we made it through COVID, but we did. <laughs> we are here. <laughs> Just about. <laughs> yeah. And I really, like I've said to you before, really admire your passion for promoting low season traveling, but also the responsible traveling aspect of what you do with low season traveler. And also really appreciate that, you know, your willingness to promote Vietnam to your audience into the world. So yeah, I want to say thank you for that. And about myself, my name is Chum. I am with Vietnam, so Indochina Travel Services. We provide um, leisure and golf holidays to Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And we have been around since 1995. It is my mother's company. I'm here to help out and hopefully can bring on some of her legacy. And then I have lived, I was born and raised in Vietnam. I lived in the States for eight years and then moved back to Vietnam for two years just before COVID happened. And I have been living in England since 2020. Wow, fantastic. So so listen, like I said, great to have you on the show. I, I want to get straight into it about Vietnam. And Vietnam is somewhere that's very much of interest to to me, as well as I know to to our listeners, Chum, as well. For me personally, I've never been to Vietnam. So I'm, I'm one of these, I think I'm a relatively typical traveler in terms of, you know, what I've, I've seen and experienced so far in, in Asia. You know, I've been to Thailand a couple of times and to Malaysia and to Bali, of course, but I've never been to Vietnam. I've never been to Cambodia. I've never been to Laos. Myanmar fascinates me, by the way, but that's an aside. We'll do another one on Myanmar another day. Um. But I, I'm sort of aware that Vietnam has, you know, people used to say to me that Vietnam is is a bit like Thailand was 20 years ago before the masses came. Is that still true of Vietnam or, you know, is, is Vietnam now quite, quite mainstream as a destination, would you say? I mean, first and foremost, I don't think I will be able to tell you what Thailand was like. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> far too young. You're far too young. I would say, yeah, Vietnam will be a little less popular mm -hmm. than Thailand or Bali or maybe sometimes like the Philippines, but it is definitely getting more and more popular. We do see a lot more tourists coming in. And yeah, I would say it is not necessarily a hidden gem, mm -hmm. but it's quite popular, but obviously not on the same level compared to Thailand or Bali. 
Yeah. Okay. I think I think that's quite quite kind of fair. And just so we so we sort of understand when are the low season months? Obviously, we 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 focus very much on on the quieter times of the year. Are there any quieter times of the year in Vietnam? Generally speaking, yes. What we in on this podcast when we say low season, that would apply to kind of more like international travelers mm-hmm. going into Vietnam, yep. and it tends to be you know. Generally, I work more with European and North American travelers. So for us, our low season is between April and September. And the high season is from October to March. So for, you know, that we call the inbound market. However, during the low inbound season, it can also be the high season for lo- for domestic travelers as well. Right. Yeah, it depends on kind of what market you're talking about and yeah, like the type or the demographic of travelers that you're referring to. Yeah. So so during the during what what we would define as the low season when there were the least number of, you know, international tourists certainly there, a great time to meet and interact with the local Vietnamese then, I guess. I would say all year round doesn't matter if it's a low season <laughs> or a high season when it comes to when you, if you're talking specifically about interacting with locals. Um, but in terms of everywhere else, I mean, like weather and everything, me personally, I prefer either April or September time. Yep. March is also nice, but again, March is still part of our high season. And the reason for this is because like around April or, sep- April and, or September time, the temperature is not like blazing hot yet. School holidays have been like are not kind of happening. So then you get a little bit less of the international travelers, but also less domestic travelers as well. So mm-hmm. if you're really looking for less crowds, those are more like those two months are more ideal. And additionally, because Vietnam is very small, but it's narrow and it's quite long. We have three geographical regions, northern, central and southern Vietnam, and they all have their different weather. So generally speaking, April and September time, the weather tends to be a little bit more consistent across the country. So if you would like to visit the whole Vietnam, it would just be easier in terms of you don't have to worry too much about the differences in weather and, you know, like less rain or kind of thing. I mean, so obviously, you know, Vietnam is, it is a tropical destination. When, broadly speaking, is the the wet t- is it is it a wet and a hot season is it one of those what, what what kind of are those kind of the the weather seasons just so we understand that yeah so this is where the region varies <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but i mean i look at it as like you know because of those differences it makes vietnam a really ideal destination to travel any time of the year because there's always an option somewhere else but generally speaking in the north, so we do have a winter in the north, although it is getting warmer these days, which is alarming. Um, Scary. But so obviously summer months are sometimes, I mean, it could start like at the end of April. That's when like the, the temperature gets really hot. And then around kind of between May to August, we would get like monsoon rain where it just dumps out like dumps down for like a couple of hours, but then it's dry. And then the fall, which is around kind of September or November, the weather tends to be a bit more dry Mm -hmm. because it's really humid up in the north. So it's a bit more pleasant. And then winter time could be somewhere between like December and February, where the temperature does drop. The average could be around 15 degrees Celsius. It It is a humid kind of cold. So it doesn't matter if you like how many layers you wear, you can still yeah. feel it. Bone. It's the same in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then kind of January, February time is kind of the, the very wet season, wet and humid season. 
it will remind you of the UK weather where <laughs> there will be misty rain, the humidity level is really high. Yeah, sometimes if you don't have like AC within your house, you can see like the walls and the windows like sweating and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Not pleasant, but I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. And then, yeah, around March, it gets, it's kind of like a mixture of like cold and hot days. So that's where kind of the weather starts changing. So that's kind of like the northern region. And like, keep in mind, I'm, I'm talking more specifically around like Hanoi and the surrounding area, mm -hmm. the temperature can get colder as you go up north closer yeah. to the mountains. And then in central Vietnam, the temperature tends to be, yeah, like hotter than the than the north. There is the rainy season between like October to kind of February, where there's a lot of rain there are storms as well because the central part of vietnam is where kind of like we have the best beaches there right. and then during the winter time the weather doesn't get too cold it it could get a bit chilly so it feels like fall here in the uk what do you what do you call chilly just so we just just so we understand <laughs> it's it's not cold but it's definitely not warm you would need to have like a light sweater Okay. Or like, or like a thin. Probably, probably like a spring day in the UK, no? Yeah, yeah, spring. <laughs> I mean, we're in spring now, and it's yeah, it's cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I still give in, and I still put on the heating because I like. <laughs> yeah, so. Um. So yeah, but then during the summertime, it can get quite hot. Mm. Around the temperature could get between anywhere between like thirty five to thirty eight. Degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius, but what I really like about Central and kind of Southern Vietnam is that although it, it gets hot in the afternoon or like evening, there's a lot of wind. So then it does cool down, whereas say like also there's a lot of buildings and everything, the heat gets trapped. Um, but in Central Vietnam, it gets really hot during the day, but because it's also drier. So if you go under the shade, um, it, it does get a bit better it does feel better and then it does cool down in the evening and then in southern vietnam it's just warm or hot all year there's no winter or anything there is the monsoon season around kind of may or june where it will rain for like an hour or two super heavy rain but it stops so you know like if you're traveling there you just have to kind of find somewhere to sit for an hour or two and you're fine and you would know you wouldn't need to pack any warm clothes when you go to just southern Vietnam because you wouldn't you wouldn't need it. <laughs> Fair point. So when when your guests you know come over to Vietnam for the first time, are they are they usually looking to try and explore as much of Vietnam as they possibly can? You know, do they go to North Central and Southern Vietnam in in one go, or do they tend to choose a location and pretty much? stay there for a couple of weeks which what what's what are you sort of seeing at the moment for most of the travelers that you're seeing coming ideally they want to see the whole country yeah. but it also depends mm -hmm. on how much time they have mm -hmm. to travel for people who only have say between like seven to ten days to spend in vietnam we suggest them to stay in one region no more than two yeah. and if somebody wants to visit the whole country we recommend a minimum of two weeks three weeks would be better like two weeks you will have to squeeze in quite a, a lot mm. a bit of a rush but yeah it, it it depends on the duration of the trip that they that they can have and also the kind of experience they are looking for as well but generally speaking if you want to see the whole country i would say no less than two weeks <laughs> No less than two weeks. Okay, so if if any listeners out there were wanting to you know explore the whole of Vietnam and they had at least two weeks, you know maybe two and a half to three weeks, what we're saying then is the the best time actually would probably be September or we kind of saying April May. Yeah, September or April. Mm -hmm. May would be excuse me. May would be a, a little bit hotter, but yeah, April that is still kind of like the transition period, and yeah. 
I would say those those are kind of like the best options during the low season. Yeah. The summer months are also really really nice as well, but then there will be crowds. <laughs> there will be crowds. We don't and we don't want crowds. So what's the you know what's the what would be the I suppose the most the most interesting itinerary that you guys do that sort of would would be a good itinerary to follow in in the low season months. Mm-hmm. What would you what would you um, recommend for somebody who hasn't been to Vietnam before? Yeah, I mean, again, I like I like to tailor, like I like to customize the experiences. Depends on you know what our travelers are looking for. But generally speaking, I would say just like a very classic itinerary. You can either start in the north and finish in the south, or vice versa. Mm-hmm. So you can fly into Hanoi, visit Hanoi, Halong Bay, maybe Ning Bing. And if they have time, I highly recommend going up to the mountains in the north. So the Hajang Loop, Sapa, where you see more nature, but you also see more ethnic groups up there that you would not be able to see in the in the city. So that's kind of like the northern part. Central Vietnam, definitely Hue, which is which used to be the old capital. Danang Hoi An. I was born in Danang, so I always love it. And Hoi An is one of my absolute favorite places on earth to something about it is the people the the vibe yeah it's just i don't know it's like <laughs> like a hug a hug to my heart when i yeah when I oh go my there. gosh that's a lovely way to put it i love that <laughs> a hug to your heart so that's hoi an so that's hoi an um it does get touristy because it is one of the like unesco um town and stuff um but yeah like I just I just love it so much and they do tourism there really well especially when it comes like to responsible tourism as well. Mm-hmm. So that is kind of like the central Vietnam. And then go down to the south obviously there is Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City and then the Mekong Delta. And then if you want kind of more beaches you can go to Phu Quoc Island or Con Dao Island. So yeah, it's that itinerary tends to be like a mixture of you know allowing people to see both the city scenes but also kind of like the more rural areas Mm -hmm. and as they go through the country they can also pick out the the regional differences across each region as well this is me stereotyping but (laughs) generally when you go like when say when you're in hanoi you get more of like a French or European influence or like kind of, yeah, you, you can kind of like pick it up quite easily. Whereas you go down to Saigon, you get more, there's still like some of the French architect, like architects around, but then you get more of like the modern, like American influence, oh, obviously tied to the history and like the wars that we had mm-hmm. in the past. But yeah, it's very, it's very different. And then like, in say like Hanoi or central Vietnam, you see more history and culture. So you see more of like the traditional Vietnam. Whereas when you go to Saigon, you see like the modern, progressive, very global and dynamic kind of atmosphere. Would it be would it be fair to say then in in sort of let's like say you know I know that we're speaking in generalizations, but southern Vietnam, by the sounds of, of what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong is you know it's more of an an international asian city it's like for example i always say you know dublin these times in the republic of ireland dublin isn't isn't ireland it's it's these days it's a european capital city like many european capital cities yes it's it's in ireland and yes it is irish but if you want the real ireland you know you you need to get outside into the into the town and in the country is it fair to say that it's that kind of you know if if travelers are looking for if they've been to Southeast Asia before, they've been to Thailand and, and they've been to Bangkok and KL and all those places. Is it a little bit more comfortable for them um, and more at ease for them to be in, in southern Vietnam? Because, you know, yeah, it's got that big international kind of feel and everything else. But for the ones that want to really get out and explore the, the true Vietnam and get a feeling that they're somewhere a little bit different to where they've been before to go central and northern. Is that is that a fair summary yes and no yeah. so 
correct kind of <laughs> <laughs> from the economic standpoint southern vietnam is definitely more international because mm. a lot of global companies they have offices in saigon whereas if you're just talking about like international people who want to go and live in vietnam as an expat it's fairly easy it doesn't matter it doesn't make that much of a difference in you know whether or not you're in Hanoi, Da Nang or Saigon. Da Nang has actually become really, really popular for expats to live there as is now getting like the facility and infrastructure are getting better. But yeah, so they would still find like little hubs and like places that they can still f- feel comfortable while making the transition to living in Vietnam. But if they are really looking to kind of either do business or kind of looking for international opportunities when it comes to like, yeah, like dealing with the economy and all that stuff, then Southern Vietnam, I think is better. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if most tourists are wanting that kind. Of, I, I don't know. I suppose it's but, it, yeah. It depends. But, yeah. It depends what they want. I think. I think certainly low season travelers they tend to want that that true authenticity. That yeah. That, that word. It's always overused, isn't it? Authentic. I'm looking for an authentic experience. But they are. <laughs> they're, they're looking yeah. for a truly Vietnamese experience. You know, they want to eat the Vietnamese food and they want to meet the Vietnamese people and they want to understand what makes the country tick. And that, what it, um, was also sort of striking to me is you were sort of talking before about the difference in the in the architecture between you know southern Vietnam, central, and northern. Is there any difference in in the in the people between north, central, and southern? You know, we, we always say in the UK, generally speaking, the further north you go, the friendlier everybody is. Mm-hmm. And no disrespect to my London friends, and I've got many, <laughs> uh, but generally, you know, the further down south, people are less friendly because they're all business and they're in a rush to get to where they want to go. But in the north generally we're we're kind of a little bit more friendly and relaxed and welcoming i like to think so what are the what are the the differences in the people like or are there any differences in the people between north central and south there are some differences and from my personal experience it's a bit of a reverse in vietnam oh, okay. where Interesting. in the north people tend to be a bit more reserved mm-hmm. to begin with but once they know you they will really open up and then as you go down south, people tend to be a bit more relaxed and approachable. Yeah. But I'm not sure if approachable is the right word here because, I mean, Vietnamese people in general, we are friendly, we're approachable, generous, kind-hearted. But yeah, I would say if kind of upon like the initial interactions, the general kind of observations that I've had is that it takes longer for people in the north to warm up whereas yeah. in the south it's very like oh yeah like hello what's up it's, it's it really it's interesting to me because I've I've heard the same said of countries like France as well and it seems mm. to broadly speaking it seems to be that the weather the warmer the weather the more relaxed mm. everybody is and they're more warm and welcoming a lot easier um, yeah. and then and and then other people tell me that it's it's all about where the capital city is because if the capital city there might be a little bit more reserved. But it's just it's just interesting to me, and I, I suppose that's what's interesting from the 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 traveler perspective. If they're going to travel throughout the whole of Vietnam, they're going to be able to see those kind of little differences in the people as well as in the architecture. Um, yeah, definitely. When they do a tour with you guys, um, what about the food? Is, is there a difference on the food as well? By the way, oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Tell me. <laughs> tell me. So again, this is just kind of my general, like my experience, yeah, yeah. but the food in the North tends to be kind of more balanced. So they put a very heavy focus on kind of the balance between kind of the presentation of the, of the whole meal, the different ingredients or like elements. So like a typical meal in Vietnam, like in a Vietnamese household consists of rice so carbs some kind of protein so you know meat fish vegetable vegetable is really yeah we love our greens and very grateful to have a good variety of vegetables so yeah it's always kind of like making sure you have a good balance of those different elements 
even when it comes to the taste and the flavors, everything is more like calculated, I suppose. And this is, I mean, I still need to do some triple fact checking here. <laughs> But my theory is that because Hanoi has always been the capital city of the country, uh, you know, even before the French came. So they obviously if they're like cooking for for the royals or the kings and stuff a different kind of royal they put more heavy focus on that and then it tends to be more savory as well whereas in the central part of vietnam things to be food can be a bit more salty and salty and spicy mm -hmm. they have a lot of seafood there and because with the history and everything they make The, their food a bit saltier because it lasts longer because think about like before oh, we had riches and everything yeah. um and then spiciness is just to kind of balance out the fishy smell um from the seafood and then in the south they tend to use more sugar in cooking so say if you have like a noodle dish you will get like you can taste a hint of sweetness in the broth compared to, you know, the same mm. bowl of noodles that you get in Hanoi. And also there's a lot of Chinese influence in the South as well, because there's quite a large um, Chinese descent community in Saigon. And then they also bring in their culture and then kind of the two cultures marry each other. So it's, yeah. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful. And then... So that's the the food, which is obviously it's a very very important part of the whole experience of of understanding a destination when you're traveling there, whether it be the low season or the high season. And we always say as well that you know the the, the food, the food and the people, you know that that is the that's a huge part of the culture mm -hmm. of of the destination. And to really understand a, a destination, it's not just about seeing it and smelling it, but it's about you know taste tasting it. And, and meeting oh, yeah. the local people as well. Tell us a little bit about some of the, I suppose, some of the impressions that you've heard from the travelers that, that you guys work with. What are their, what are the sort of the common themes on their first impressions? What are their, what are they telling you after they've been and they've had their first trip to Vietnam? What are the most common kind of, not reviews, but what, what are the kind of feedback that you get as to how much they've enjoyed the experience and what, what particularly they enjoyed about it? What's the feedback that you get? I would say the one of the most common feedbacks that I've gotten in the past is always down to the people. I think a lot of travelers, they are surprised by like how kind the local people are and they they also get surprised sometimes when you know the local people they go above and beyond they go out of their way to either help them or just kind of yeah like offer something or just try to kind of introduce like some local products or culture so i think that is one of the things that really really stands out to to travelers i know they are definitely like obviously they are good and bad people everywhere and then you know people still get like less pleasant experiences but generally speaking it's the people they sometimes you know a lot of i'm and i'm sure you have heard of this kind of story before where you know the some travelers they are in vietnam they stumble upon like a local family and the family just ask them to like come join the meal or you know oh, like wow. come join the party that they are having on that day and then <laughs> have a great time together um And I think another thing, this depends on, you know, the the, the personal experience, but the karaoke scene. <laughs> oh, really? No, I did Vietnamese not know that. Love. There's a karaoke um, scene. <laughs> Vietnamese people love karaoke and they oh, have like no. karaoke machines at home as well. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So oh. I think for a lot of people, they find it quite different to what they're used to. Mm. But to some people, they just look at it and be like, that is such a quite like an interesting experience to just see like you're walking on the street and then you can just hear people singing karaoke. Like, oh, wow. Left <laughs> is it, I'm curious now, is it because I love karaoke as well. Is it is it karaoke like they do in Japan, which is very much enclosed booths just with a group of friends? Or is it karaoke like they do, I guess, in the UK and Ireland? where it's just in front of everybody and you just grab the mic and start singing. So there is 
definitely like places where you can go to to do karaoke with your friends and you're just in a room yeah. but they are also literally just like a mic yeah. <laughs> like a phone with youtube on <laughs> and then Love people it. just sit at home you don't need to go to the pub you don't need to go to the bars oh wonderful <laughs> just at home concerts So, so if well, when I should say when I go to Vietnam because I I love karaoke. The best way for me to to get in with the locals will be to do a bit of karaoke then, right? Oh yeah, I mean if you <laughs> if you go that extra mile and join them in a session, they would keep you. They would not let you to go like let you go home. <laughs> oh my god, I love that! I love that. Hey, chum. Sadly, we are out of time. It does fly over and it clicks over. I know. It's been wonderful speaking with you about Vietnam. It's it, it is so high on my proverbial bucket list. I'm desperate to get over there at some point. And now that now, now I know there's karaoke. Well, gosh, you know, <laughs> it's 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 moved even higher up the list. And but thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And I'd love to do another one of these podcasts later on, so we can get even more under the skin of Vietnam and maybe some of those other destinations around Southeast Asia as well. Uh, but for now, thank you so much, Chum. I really appreciate it. Definitely, thank you. And I would love to show you around in Vietnam. Just let me know when you're awesome. ready. I'll hold you to that. <laughs> Thanks, Chum. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. So there you have it. And if Chum has got you yearning for more information about the low season experiences in Vietnam, then why not head over to the Vietnam section of lowseasontraveler.com, where you can learn even more as well as appreciate some of the amazing photos we have on there too. We could only produce these low season guides thanks to the incredible and generous local knowledge which Chum and her team have provided. And before you go, if you haven't subscribed yet to the Low Season Traveler magazine, you can do so at lowseasontraveler.com/magazine. The hard copies are only thirty-five pounds for four beautifully presented editions each year. But that's our show for this week. Thanks as always for your company. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please do leave us a positive rating and review on your podcast app. And also, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn to be the first to hear our latest low season stories, articles, and guides. For now, have a great week wherever you are, and remember that travel is always better and fairer for the planet, the local communities, and you, the travellers, when it's without the crowds. <laughs>